Okay, what I'd, I'd like to do is to um, just tell you a little bit about, uh, maybe to begin why I'm here, uh, a little bit about who I am and what I hope to do. We have about 40 minutes, I think. I know some of you have to get back to classes. Um, and I'm, I'm here because I think my, my life has been, uh, in some ways, uh, kind of an expression of, uh, I know the first, the original topic was integrative medicine. Uh, and um, I guess that strikes me in terms of my, the, my own family background, you know, that I was born in uh, post-war Japan. My mother was, was a native Japanese woman. My father was uh, the son of Irish immigrants to the States. Uh, and so I grew up in a family in which there were very different uh, perspectives about what was health and what was illness and just about any, everything else in life, too. Uh, from these two very different sides of the family. Uh, and, of course, as a child, sometimes you think it's just your parents are different. Uh, but then you realize as you get older that it's other people in the family and it's also something that you start to study about in and call culture. Uh, and you see that culture is something that's very, uh, you know, not a, a defined, uh, rigid, crystallized type of something you read about in a book, but it's something, it's a process that is constantly changing. Um, I'm getting a call here. It's probably from my, yeah, it's from my son. Um, which reminded me of why I wanted to just, uh, uh, so my life has been, uh, um, I, th uh, I guess, an integration or a balancing of these different types of, of cultures. And one way that has expressed itself has been in the area of, of health care. Uh, and I've spent about, maybe I have uh, about 30 years of my career now in this area. And about half of them have been in Japan and half have been in the States. And much of the time in the States, I've been working in issues of Asian American communities. Uh, so I've tried to bring those kinds of perspectives together. Uh, and in, in many ways, there, um, I see those kind of in the daily uh, expressions of those in my family. So I'll just tell you very quickly about three interactions already this morning. Um, first, I called my sister because my mother, who is 86, has uh, fallen and fractured her pelvis. So she was in uh, emergency care for a few days. Then she's been moved to a rehab facility. So I call up, uh, I talk to my mother first. How are you, mom? Oh, pretty good. <coughs> Is it, uh, are you in much pain? Oh, no, it's not too bad. Um, um, should I come visit you? You should never ask that as, you know. She, oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> you know, you better stay there, take care of your kids. And so it sounds like everything's fine. You know? So then I call up my sister. I say, how's mom? She said, oh, she's in a lot of pain. You know, she's, she can't sleep. Uh, she's uh, feeling nauseous from the medication. Um, so I call my mother again. I said, mom, you, know how you, you said you're doing fine. She said, well, it's not that bad. <laughs> uh, and then she says, uh, and I said, but um, they don't really take good care of you here. You know, I've got to... My mouth is all dry. It hasn't washed. I haven't washed my teeth for a day. And I said, well, you've got to tell the people, you know. You've got to tell the, call them. You've got a bell there, I'm sure. Call them and say you need some help. Said, oh, that's okay. Your sister will be here tomorrow, and I can wash my teeth tomorrow. I said, Mom, you, want, you don't want to wait a whole day to wash your teeth. You know, your mouth doesn't feel good. You've got to, you've got to tell, tell the people there and ask them for some help. Tell them what you need. So this, uh, this incident reminded me of a lot of, of very common issues that you see among certain patients, right? Uh, you get a very different picture when you talk to some, the patient themselves and when you talk to the family. And so for some people, their way of expressing their distress is very different from the way other people express their distress. And some of that is very personal, individual, and some of that is very cultural. It's a way that they have learned in their socialization to act. Uh, then I called, um, I got, my, my wife got off the phone with her sister in Japan and says the, uh, her s sister was supposed to come over with her mother and visit us this summer, but she's been developed this um, problem, a gastrointestinal problem, and she may not be able to come. 
Uh, and so she's describing how she's feeling. Well, she's hanging around the house a lot, and she seems upset because she's been trying to get married for the past few months, but hasn't been able to successfully get a good match. Uh, and she's going through all these computer services, but they're not working out. She makes a bunch of jerks, she says. And so she's hanging out the house, and the mother is there. And um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with inner city apartments in, in the major cities in Asia, but like Tokyo or Hong Kong. They literally live in a, you know, like a corner, space about as big as that corner, she and her mother. Uh, and they're right on top of each other, like all the time. And so the two of them are in there, and she's describing the way she's feeling. She doesn't have any energy to go out. She's talk the way she talks sounds like she's you know, really, really discouraged about things, and on and on. And I said, well, you know, it sounds like depression to me. <coughs> sounds like your sister's depressed. Uh, I said, oh, no, she's been to the doctor. She's, and the doctor said what she has is Jiritsu uh, Shinkei Shicho Sho, which is a translation of, uh, the English translation is autonomic, autonomic nervous system imbalance. Now, something you don't hear about in the United States or many other countries, but in Japan, you commonly hear people say, oh, I went to the doctor and he said, I have this Jiritsu Shinkei Shicho Sho. Uh, and the symptoms sound very similar to the symptoms that someone trained like I was as a psychologist would say, well, this sounds like ang there's anxiety and possibly depression, too. Uh, the third case uh, this morning, I had to go to the, to the public school here because my son is, uh, has an F in algebra. Now, it's pretty hard to get an F in algebra, you know, or, or and a D in world history. <laughs> That's pretty hard, too, considering they, you know, you just have to read the book. Uh, and a C minus in biology. So I had to go talk to the counselor. Uh, and the, the counselor um, said, well, have you talked to your son about this? Uh, and also, he was smelling like marijuana last week, too. So we had a lot of issues to talk about. And, um, but what, what happened was it opened up a lot of conversation with him about why, how school is. Uh, and one of the big issues at his school is his school has become increasingly more Asian. So that's what they call an influx you know, of, of Asians into this community. And there have been articles like in the Wall Street Journal a couple of years back in which they talked about the new white flight. You know, and the new white flight was people leaving Cupertino, one of the neighboring towns here, because the, of so many Asians coming into the public schools and they were feeling that the competition was too, there was too much competition. Uh, and so that my son, who is from Asia himself, born and raised there, is also complaining that it's too much competition at this school and that everybody only cares about their grades and that most of the kids he knows are cheating too to get their grades up. Uh, but that that's all that seems to matter to, to them. Uh, and there have also been five suicides over the past months of kids at, at this school or recent graduates of the school uh, and it all contributes to an atmosphere that he claims is one that just makes him not want to go to school anymore. Uh, so these three uh, my things that I talked about today are um, part of a picture, a larger picture about that I'm trying to paint about issues of, of uh, Asian immigrants and the kinds of narratives uh, that, that uh, you hear about that are talk, speak to greater uh, social issues and issues of health disparities, uh, and which I hope to get to, but I'm going to go to it in a, in a somewhat different manner, which is to instead to introduce you to uh, a narrative about my grandmother, which um, I will then ask you to, to think about uh, how does this relate to the uh, issues of something like what's called cultural competence? Uh, how does this relate to issues of health disparities? Uh, how do you, um, what can you possibly learn from the story of one individual that may help you t to lead you to further insights that you might be able to apply in, in your clinical work? Um, so this, it's, not, it's a short story, but um, it's uh, one that uh, happened to me when I was, uh, when I was younger. There was a period of time when I lived in a part of uh, an island in Japan called Shikoku, which is in the western, southwestern part of Japan. And I was living with my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, who um, 
I guess uh, somebody I, I you know have known since birth because I was born in Tokyo, and she. Um, This was before I had studied anything about clinical psychology, which became the, the area of my formal study in the United States. And I was studying there uh, of, with uh, traditional East Asian medicine, which is you know, acupuncture and herbal treatments and shiatsu and um, a different, whole completely different medical system. And so I was living with my grandmother. And she was a little bit uh, unsteady on her feet because she had had an operation. And so I, uh, in the, this is a, just one day in her life when I happened to be uh, spending the day with, the whole day with her t in her terms of her medical care. Uh, so in the morning, we go off to what they call the uh, Kenritsu Chuo Byoing, which is a huge hospital in the, uh, you're nodding, you know that hospital? <laughs> Byoing, okay. Uh, a very a huge uh, hospital in the center of, of the city and uh, she's going to see her internist there. And um, so she goes to see this guy, and his name is uh, Cho, which is a kind of a typical, stereotypical Chinese name. And uh, so I go in with her because she's a little bit unsteady, and he um, kind of acknowledges that I'm there, just barely, and greets her. And, uh, and what we have done, as uh, you might know, most countries in the world besides the United States have had uh, national health care for years. In Japan, they have it. but um, it's not all perfect, you know, and so she can get health care very, very cheaply, but her, um, there's a, a, a saying that you wait three hours to get a three-minute treatment. So we've been waiting in the waiting room. There are no appointments. Uh, you'd simply go to the hospital, get a number, and you wait. So we've been waiting, and if we finally get in to see the doctor, uh, the doctor looks at her and says, oh, how are you? And she says, oh, well, I'm, I'm good. And he said, well, um, so how's your, how's your stomach feeling? He says, oh, it's, um, it's okay. And, well, can, I, I'm, and then he says, well, the tests show that you're, it's, you look, these, uh, the polyps are, you know, we've got rid of them and don't look, they don't seem to be a problem. And uh, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm okay. Um, but I haven't been, I haven't had much appetite recently and I, I haven't been uh, eating too much and, Maybe it's just because it's the middle of the summer and it's so hot. And he says, oh, well, you should eat more then. So that's it. The appointment's over. He says, uh, I'll see you in, in a couple of weeks. <clears throat> so we get up and leave. And we go back home. I go into the kitchen. And she makes some tea. And uh, then I notice she's got her purse. Oh, first of all, sorry, we went downstairs. <clears throat> no. Sorry, I'm blowing the story. Okay, so anyway, she's, she had her purse, and I noticed she goes into her purse, and she takes something out, opens the uh, closet door in the kitchen, goes in there and puts something there. And then she closes the door, and she goes off to her room to, to change her clothes. And I'd seen her do this before, but I didn't know what was, she was doing, so I was curious. I opened the closet door, and I look in there, and I'm looking around, and finally I see a paper bag, and the bag, I go into the bag, and it's full of medicine. And on top, there's uh, some bags of medicine, all kinds of pills and, and uh, these little packets, powders, white powder packets. Uh, and I look at it, and there's one, there's a bunch of them from that, it's got that date on it, and it's got her name on it. Um, so I'm wondering what she's doing. So I go over to, the, to her and I say, Grandma, what, uh, what's all that uh, stuff in the bag? She says, oh, that's my medicine. I said, well, why is it in the bag? She says, well, I'm not going to take it. I said, what do you mean you're not going to take it? Didn't the doctor give it to you? She said, oh, yeah. He gives it to me every time I see him. And I said, well, it seems to be uh, piling up there in the closet. And she said, well, I'm not going to take that. That's, that's much too strong. I said, well, why don't you tell him? I said, well, he's very proud. You know? And he went to the best university in Japan, you know, and he's very proud. And I, I can't tell him that. I said, why not? She said, well, it, look, it would look disrespectful because he gave me the medicine. I said, but I think he, you know, he needs to know whether you're taking the medicine or not, because he assumes you're taking it. Because she always says yes. You know, she, looks, she looks to be like a compliant patient. She said, no, I, c I couldn't tell him that, and he would never understand. Uh, but 
And then she smiles at me, and the smile means, you know, you're too young or you're too American to understand the way things work in this society. Um, so I give up, and I, we go back, uh, I go back out, and we have lunch, and uh, after lunch, she gets dressed again, and we, this time we get, walk over to the, to the bus stop, and we wait for a bus that's going to take us in the opposite direction, away from the city. And we're going up uh, towards the mountains uh, through some villages, and finally we get to a place where there's a village, and there's a sign that says in, in Japanese, which would you would say the, the New Life Clinic. And we get off there, and we go in, and there's a, as soon as we open the door, you can smell the smoke. And the smoke has got this uh, very sweet kind of herbal smell that comes out. Uh, and then we go in, and to the left, there's a bunch of, uh, there's some benches in the corner, and there's some old ladies sitting on the benches talking. And there's lots of treatment beds, and some of them have curtains drawn. Some of them are open. Uh, and then in the other corner is a guy with his eyes closed. Uh, and he's, as soon as he hears the door open, though, he says, oh, that's you. Right? That's Stephen. That's just my first name. And, uh, and so he greets us, and then he, we sit, um, sit there, and he starts to ask her how she is. Uh, and she says, well, I'm, I haven't been feeling so well because I, I don't have much appetite, and it makes me feel tired. And, and he says, well, you'd better come over then. And so she lays down on the, on the bed, and he starts to touch her. First, he t puts three fingers on her, her wrist to take her pulse. It's, and uh, he can't see, so he doesn't do some forms of traditional diagnosis, which would be to look at the tongue, to look at the skin color. Uh, but instead, he uses his fingers a lot. Uh, he's touching her in different places, especially around the abdomen, which she's saying this is where she has some pain. Uh, uh, and then he starts to tell her, you know, well, it seems like, you know, your, your stomach and your pancreas are really out of balance and your intestines are not, are not I can feel the hardness there. Uh, and then he asked me to come over and to feel it. And he said, do you feel that? And I don't feel anything. And he says, you're thinking too much about girls. Stop it. <laughs> Concentrate. And I said, no, I'm not thinking about girls. I just don't feel it. Uh, and I you know, can sense that his sensitivity you know, is very powerful. Um, and perhaps partly he's been blind since about eight years old. Uh, but he can feel it, and I can't feel it. Uh, and I've been trying to feel it. Um, but he, and he tells her, you know, this is what your problem is. And he has a name for it. And he says, you know, this is, you have this, and it's causing you uh, to have the loss of appetite. And uh, that's why you feel the heaviness here. And that's why you feel a little bit dizzy when you, when you st stand up suddenly. Uh, and then he starts to put needles into different places uh, in her body. And of course, there's no bleeding because the places are acupuncture points. Um, and then he comes over after the, uh, and he has some, uh, what's called, I don't know what it's called in English, OQ. Um, moxa, is moxa, is that an English word? Uh, which is an herb, which he then also burns at certain points on the body. Uh, and then he says, what you, this is, uh, he shows, makes some marks and, and says, this is where you need to do it for her tom starting tomorrow every day. So you need to give her this same treatment. Um, and since you can't feel where to do it, I'll mark it for you. And then I get a box of, of er, uh, some herbal treatments, uh, some of the herb, and then I take it home. Um, and he also says to her, now you need to, uh, you need to stop worrying so much about your grandson, which is me. Uh, you know, I'm sure he'll be fine. <laughs> he'll find a nice wife, and I'm sure he'll get a good job someday. Um, but you need to stop worrying so much, and uh, you need to... Um, you need to rest more, you need to take a nap, and you need to go to bed earlier tonight. Uh, and you need to avoid fried foods. I want you to just have the miso soup with tofu and some wakame, the seaweed. Uh, and just have, and make sure you have umeboshi plums with every meal. Uh, and so that's, uh, he gives her the name of the treatment, gives her advice, and then we're on our way. So I'm going to stop the story, since we don't have a lot of time, and just to ask, uh, maybe we can engage in a conversation about it. What do you see in the story that uh, has anything to do with why and how people see illnesses, uh, how people 
see the, um, the way to treat illnesses, um, how there are different ways of, of seeing that, and, uh, and then to reflect also on, on yourself. This is a particular story of a particular person in a particular cultural context. Um, and there are probably things that are different to you, but also probably things that are similar to you. Something that also <coughs> resonates with you about in your, your life or your experience, and maybe with your family. So I'll just invite you to, to respond. Um, I think I gave you a couple of questions here that might just prompt that. The, uh, the question the, at the bottom of the page, the three questions for reflection. What are some clinical implications of the narrative? And what does the story tell you about integrative medicine? Someone like to begin? He was uh, he was a yes an MD uh, biomedically trained doctor. Right. So in that position, maybe inherently had some kind of biases against um, maybe um, the different ways that she, he, she could possibly be thinking about her illness, and so um, I think he just didn't do a good job of really getting out like how she was experiencing what she was feeling, and also um, like explaining it the best. For example, when he gave her the medicine, he could have easily explained why it was useful and made it uh -huh. made up almost like a, a pact with her to say, okay, the, I know you understand you don't want to take this medicine. Like, it's it's not what you think is going to solve the illness, but maybe have some kind of mm -hmm. interaction with her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. I think also maybe, like, he didn't even know that she didn't want the medicine. Right. You know, like, like maybe he would have been totally willing to prescribe a medicine she was more comfortable with if they hadn't even broached the subject. Mm -hmm. it just, but it just seems like they didn't have like a personal enough interaction that she felt comfortable saying that. And he asked and she just assumed mm -hmm. that she was complying with that. Yeah. Whereas like with the, with the traditional um, medical healer, he seemed a lot more, he seemed more comfortable with them. And so it seemed mm -hmm. like Yeah. So th the two statements seem to, they bring up issues about, I guess, what do we know about this doctor as an individual? Um, what might be in, what might be his particular way of, of handling something? And then a larger issues about a health care system too. Like I, I mentioned that this is a place where we've been waiting, you know, the, for a long time and we get in there and there's only a few minutes and there's a long line of people waiting to get in there. Um, and so the question of how much is uh, this particular doctor's style, how much is a result of a, of a medical system that, in which he feels I only have three minutes because I've got a whole line of patients out there and I don't have time to get that kind of information which might be very crucial though. I guess the one question that I have is for like your grandmother, if she yeah. Right. Her medication, but really do anything in terms of what the doctor told her to do. Yeah. So it's interesting that she decided to go to the Western Area Hospital and also to the traditional mm, medicine. Yeah. And if it wasn't quite working for her to go to the Western Area Hospital, then yeah. why did she keep going back home? Okay. That's, yeah, that's a real crucial question, right? Is she, <coughs> why is she going in the morning to this? to this very modern hospital that has all the latest technology, where she has had surgery, where she has had, um, you know, she's swallowed the camera that has gone into her stomach and has shown her that she's had some polyps there and she's had them removed. Why is she going there? Really you want to answer your? Respect towards the doctor and I get yeah. Taking the medication, not having any 
Well, she, but uh, the first thing is that she has some respect for the doctor and I think for the whole medical system. Right? What else do you see there? Oh, that's basically what I was going to oh. say. <coughs> you want to add something? Um, yeah. yeah, well, I had, yeah. Uh, in high school, I had some career and foster siblings, and it, like, what I noticed from that was that in their culture, it seemed very much like if they were told by someone that was higher up in the social hierarchy to do something, then you did it. Right. Like, without question. And so maybe it's it's more just that, like, the doctor is telling her to come back in three weeks. It's like, call her before. Mm -hmm. like, like, the reason that she's not taking the medicine is that she feels strongly enough about it not to disobey. But, like, she doesn't feel strongly enough about, like, actually visiting okay. and disobeying it. I don't yeah. know if that's... <coughs> okay. Um, so I think you're pointing out a general kind of cultural, cultural characteristic in a sense that there is a great deal of... Um, East Asian societies are based in Confucianism, and there's a great deal of respect still given in a hierarchical sense to people who have a certain level of, of authority and position in, in the society. And I think it's revealed still, you know, to some extent in patient, doctor-patient relationships that you don't challenge or you don't question. Or There's even not the same level of communication. One thing I started to do in Japan was to speak English to doctors. Uh, I, I can communicate easily enough in Japanese, but I found a, I received a whole different kind of care if I communicated in English. So rather than speaking, and then I would go with my wife even, and I would ask the doctor questions in English, and the doctors would almost like, you see this radical shift in the way they looked at you and talked, and then suddenly they were speaking to you, and they were explaining, and he's up at the board, and he's drawing a picture of the stomach, and, and, and then he's saying, do you have any more questions? Oh, wow, this is amazing. It's just a radical shift in as though, you know, in Japanese it's like this, and it, this is the way I do it. And then when he spoke in English, he had a whole different persona and, and a different, because he had often, these people had trained at Stanford or they had trained at uh, hospitals here, and they learned this is the way you, d do you deal with patients. They need to know this information. You d uh, you have the, they have the right to that information. You, as a doctor, have the responsibility to give them this information uh, and a whole different style of, of communicating. I just wanted to add on what everyone else was saying. Like, I kind of think, I don't know, this is just from my personal experience with, yeah. <coughs> with my family. Um, what I notice is that they sort of tend to value, you know, sort of like almost like more like natural medicine sort of thing and also this sort of um, um, like medical I think something that possibly would bring more of attention to these types is just kind of like looking for for confirmation from like doctor right. visits. You know that you know oh I'm covering all my bases right yeah. now. You know this is like the doctor says like you know I'm fine. I just should be eating more. But I think she also seems to be putting more value. Like she just wants to like make sure that you know like there's something else. You know like that feed that other. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think she is going there to make sure that <coughs> the cancer is not back. Um, she has been told by the doctor in the afternoon, Doctor Shimiza, that she doesn't. It's not there. But he also says, "I but I know you would rather check this by the uh, the latest technology, and and that would convince you even more. And so you know, by all means, go and go to this other doctor too, and have him tell you that." You know, it doesn't exist, or that he can give you the latest test. Um, so she's covering her, her basis to make sure that it's not there. Uh, and if you look at the whole the history of medicine there, uh, what was once the, the Chinese system was once the most popular system in Japan, but it was completely replaced when uh, Dutch brought what was called <coughs> Western medicine to Japan. And there was never, and that, that's why Dr. Shimizu, who is blind, because it was the, the, that medical system was relegated to a lower status. And therefore, people who were blind went into that uh, profession, and the people who were not blind were still going to, were then studying Western medicine. So it was a whole different uh, hierarchy in terms of medicine. And um, 
there's the respect there that you, people in Japan respect that this is, you need to uh, make sure by the latest tests and technologies and surgeries, everything that biomedical medicine offers, you've got to use that as well. Uh, and then being very aware of what, you know, the shortcomings, um, which is something that almost in any country is, is fairly recent in the sense of the, the realization that of what it cannot do and the kinds of chronic illnesses and that are simply not solved. Uh, and therefore, people looking for other ways of dealing with, and sometimes that's new ways, but for sometimes it can be returning to something that's considered very traditional or what was the other word you used? Natural yeah. or natural remedies or homeopathic remedies. Or <laughs> so you described the, you know, the doctor treating you differently when you spoke English. Yes. I just wanted to, what is your thought on this? Is this him just responding to the cultural cues of Dr. <laughs> I'm assuming most of these were made of Japanese or? Most of what? Most of the doctors are made yes. of Japanese. So, I mean, is that just how they learn to adapt with, their, you know, I guess patients of different cultures or is this a bad thing? I think it was something that ha occurred very spontaneously and naturally, um, that he was used to, a cut, his behavior was formed within a certain context, a cultural context, and then it, it therefore came out very naturally. And, um, personally, I would like to see the, the, the Japanese system also modified uh, so that, to, that patients feel more rights to ask questions and that the doctor in turn feels that he has the responsibility more to, to answer questions and to ask patients, do you understand the treatment that you're being given? Um, and that because of the kinds of problems that exist when uh, it's dealt with in this way of the, the three minute interview and not, not finding out, is, is she really taking the medicine? Does she, you know, if she does take it, what happens? Is she getting any other treatment in the afternoon? And, you know, in terms of integrative medicine issues, are there any issues there? You know, is there any possible conflict between an herbal treatment that she's getting and the kinds of drugs that this doctor is giving her? And um, so in terms of the integrative medicine theme, you know, that's clearly not happening there. Uh, the afternoon doctor has much more of a sense of integrative medicine, partly from, I think, the fact that Chinese medicine has a more philosophically a more a, of a sense of re, uh, using many, seeing things more holistically, which makes it much fit uh, e a lot easier in this kind of integrative medicine paradigm. Um, and that's also partly out of need because he knows that uh, the patients don't completely trust that system either. And they think that they can't, that system also cannot treat certain things uh, that she needs the other system for. So partly out of need, he knows he has to also allow his patients to be open and that he also is more aware of his limitations in treatment. Yeah, other thoughts? Yeah. This might be going on a tangent, but Malcolm Gladwell talked about this in his last book in terms of pilots. Um, there had been the Korean Airlines that had a lot of crashes where the co-pilot oh, was like yeah. too afraid to say something when the, yeah. when the captain guess. was yeah. And so now, like, it seems like the early 90s, they've been having them speak English to each other, and that, like, changed the dynamic of the... Oh, yeah, yeah that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so that when they were speaking in Korean, the, me the messages, which were actually often very dire, were not that clear. And, um, <laughs> yeah. Outliers. Not the bad, but outliers. Yeah. Yeah, there's a saying... Um, I do some uh, cross-cultural work too with, uh, with the U.S. Marines cause, and the U.S. Navy because they still have military bases <laughs> in Japan. And uh, that's, a, that's an expression I often use, which is never take yes for an answer. You know, meaning that, like my mother said, how, you're, how, are you, how are you? I'm fine. Or, you know, are they treating you well? Yeah, it's okay. And, um, but the, 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 that sense of, of reserve and, and uh, not saying things directly um, you know, and that's a good example of even when things are, are often very serious situations, it's, it's hard to get 
that sense that things are really uh, upsetting, and which becomes a, a big issue in something like depression, right? Detecting depression. Um, I remember I had a psychotherapy client in, in Tokyo, and um, she had come to me, and we were talking for a, a long time. And at the beginning, I said, "How are you?" "Oh, I'm fine." And and I and then towards the end, she started to describe, "Well, actually, I, you know, I haven't been out of the house." for the past week. This is the first time, you know, I came, I got out of the house to come to talk to you. And I was actually, you know, mostly lying in bed and I hardly ate anything. And, and I thought, oh my God, you know, here, I, I thought I'm so experienced and I'm so culturally aware and sensitive. And, and yet I was kind of seduced by her, you know, yeah, everything's okay and you know, don't worry. And, uh, and it just reminded me of, oh God, you really have to be vigilant and, and uh, it, know, sensitive to picking up cues that are, um, it, that you may not get verbally from somebody. How about some other people, the thoughts that you might be having about uh, this kind of, of behavior in terms of health care? Does it remind you of anything in your own, your own backgrounds or families? Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's a good point. It, it, it brings up the issue of that you may need even more time for the interview, right? Because you're, you're being encouraged to ask indirect questions, right? And as a way of eliciting more of an openness and re response by the patient. And then, um, but it, it's also commonly known in the whole area of, of intercultural interaction that when you interact with, often with East Asians, you do, there's a longer period of time in which you have to cultivate the relationship before you will get any, the, the sense of trust that would enable the, the person to reveal something to you. And that's certainly no different and maybe even more you know, apparent in the clinical interview in which that sense of trust, uh, a respect might be there, but not a trust that this is something that you can tell to this doctor because, uh, like you said, the doctor may not approve of that other system. You don't know that and therefore may tell you why you, you, you shouldn't go to that doctor because he's, you know, that's superstition or that's, that's stupid. And uh, if you don't trust the doctor, you can't tell them that. Yeah. How about some, some other people reactions? What kind of thoughts does it bring up in, in, in you about health? Medical, different medical systems. Curious, did your um, grandma follow up with the treatment with the traditional medical healers? Did she? I mean, was that effective at all? Did yeah, she know? kept. Um, I mean, she kept going to the morning morning uh, in, uh, the hospital, but she also kept up with the afternoon, which is. It, I don't know how many of you know about that kind of treatment, but it's something that has to be done continuously, mm -hmm. right? or that um, it may take several months, and you're told, you're warned that this is not a one-time treatment. You get one acupuncture treatment and you're healed, but mm -hmm. uh, it takes uh, some time. I, I had uh, once a treatment for an eye, eye disorder that I went for about three months. Um, I had a miraculous healing, actually. I never, I was wearing uh, glasses for a couple of years with, with um, and uh, I had, this was like in 1970 when James Reston, the New York Times reporter, was, had an emergency surgery in China, uh, and they used acupuncture for part of the anesthesia. And then it became a huge publicity, and lots of Chinese uh, practitioners were coming to the U.S. and were being sponsored by MDs here. Uh, and so I, I had this pain in my eye, and I decided to see what, what would happen. And so I had a series of about three months of weekly treatments. And this, uh, in Japanese, it's called a keiraku, which is um, a line, an energy line. 
uh, I think it's called a meridian in English. And so I'd have needles put along this energy line around the back of my head. And then the, the, the killer was the, uh, the final needle would go into the, this little pink place, you know, in, the, in your eye. Uh, and you can, can you met, and he's saying, keep your eye open. And the, <laughs> and the, and the needle is coming towards your eye. Um, and you have to keep your eye open. And, it, and when it sinks in you, this is the strangest feeling you can imagine of you, something. There's no pain, but you feel something going into the middle of your head, it feels like. And it's like jelly, you know, and, uh, and then the tears just, you know, pour out. And um, so I, I actually trusted enough in, this, in that. And uh, so I had a number of treatments like that. And then I, um, it seemed to, uh, the op, that, that pain in my optic nerve or whatever it was, was uh, lessened, and I never wore the glasses since then. I've had more, less miraculous uh, treatments, uh, like gastrointestinal problems, which I, again, had like weekly treatments for months. Uh, but in her case, it, it, part of the treatment was that the family part, too. So if I had more time, I would, oh, in fact, we don't have any more time. But I would go into the, you know, I, I gave you a list of things about why Asian American patients say that they're not satisfied, and you can see a lot of the things in, in the, in the quality of care she received in the morning are shown there. And then why she was satisfied with the afternoon care, there's, there's some obvious reasons which I could also tell you about. But one of them is that it brings the family in. So I had to give her the treatment. I had to touch my grandmother, uh, and I had to show my concern for it. So it's a, it's a very holistic type of, of treatment. Did, some, did you have your hand up? Or is, oh, oh, you did. OK. I had had an accident. Yeah, I'd, I'd fallen backwards on a bat when I was playing basketball and hit my head, and uh, then my vision started to, to gradually deteriorate, and I had pain like in the eye and that whole uh, area. Yeah, but when I'd been to um, medical doctors, I they hadn't been able to say anything except for <coughs> wear glasses, um, which is another difference between the, her morning and her afternoon. The doctor in the morning could uh, she said I don't feel well, and he said well eat more, which is, you know, not to, if you don't feel good, you don't feel like eating. <laughs> you don't feel like eating more, certainly, either, whereas the, in, in the afternoon, she felt a much more uh, a sense of treatment. Well, this is what you do if you want to make yourself feel better. How long ago did this happen? Uh, this is about 20 years ago. Would you uh, have the same case now after your concern? No. There's, uh, I mean, certainly, <coughs> in different age groups that this uh, certainly exists, but there is still this, uh, a distinction, but there's, if I could carry this story further, I'd say there are also now people who are trying to do more of integrative medicine in, in Japan and certainly in Asian American communities, and if Stephen Chen had come, he would have talked, been able to talk about that. But uh, I, I mentioned this partly because uh, there's, uh, and this is also a story in Asia, but that 70% of Asian Americans are immigrants. So they bring with them often their medical systems and their beliefs. Uh, but the, certainly the trust of and, um, my friend in that same city has started an integrative medicine uh, department in which he's trying to, to bring those two systems together much more. And so that would be the next step in the story. But there's, we have to end, right, Ron? Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you. And thank you for help and listening and participating. <laughs> Take a two-minute break, and you all can welcome to join upstairs.